and we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Best Phone Plans Podcast. Today, Dennis and I are joined by special guest Austin Lutz. Austin works for Cloverhound, and he's got a wide range of knowledge when it comes to voice technology. So in this episode, we're talking about voice over LTE, voice over NR, which stands for new radio, or is basically voice over 5G. I think it's going to be a really great and exciting episode. So Austin, I want to welcome you to the show. He's over here. How are you doing today? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Dustin. I'm um, doing good. I uh, hope you guys are as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so where do you want to start when it comes to like voice technology, like how it, how it originated? I feel like there's been mm. so many evolutions with 2G, 3G, LTE, and now 5G. Where do you think is a good jumping off point when it comes to voice? I think, you know, for, for this discussion, I think we could probably start around 3G. Um, you know, we, we can start talking about some of the ways that voice evolved starting from 3G going all the way up to the current standard of 5G, right? So when we think about voice in the cellular space, you know, that's really the most important thing about our cell phones. And I guess that's starting to change for a lot of people. Um, but historically, you know, what people want is to have a nice crystal clear audio call, nice wide band, uh, reliable, consistent. And um, there's a there's a group called the 3GPP. They develop standards for all of cellular technology. Um, and they developed the original uh, 3G voice standard. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what year that was, but it was quite some time ago when 3G came out. Um, I know that uh, voice over LTE was coined early in 2012 by coincidentally Metro PCS. No um, way. Yeah, that that was prior prior to the acquisition by T-Mobile um, before they were obviously rebranded to Metro by T-Mobile. But yeah, so um, just going you know going from 3G to 4G was really the biggest evolution in the way that we route voice calls. Uh, voice over LTE opened up an immense amount of bandwidth um, using the IVAS codec, uh, which allowed for, uh, you know, the acronym is SWB, but it's literally called super wideband. Um, okay, very, okay. very technical yeah. uh, term that they decided to use. So do I'm you, not- Do you know like yeah. what the bandwidth went to? Like for 3G, it could yeah. be like some kilobit per second and with LTE, suddenly it like opened yeah. up to what? Yeah, so it went um, it went up to when it went to voice over LTE, it went up to sixty four kilobits per second. Um, and for those that are watching that would think of that in like home phones or like office phones at people's desks, uh, there's a codec called G seven eleven, and that's probably the closest comparison that I can make to what super wideband would be. Uh, we will see a lot of G seven eleven codecs with our carriers that we work with. Uh, where I work, um, typically when you'd walk into like a bank, right? And they all have phones on their desks uh, and they connect to some magical network that routes these phone calls uh, to and from cell phones. So when we go in and we set up the phone system or the contact center or any method to communicate with people in the outside world, we're having to figure out what codec to, to decide on. Um, and again, we would choose G711 because that's not a cellular technology. Um, but in voice over LTE land, we're going to be choosing the uh, super wideband codec because that's uh, it's obviously gives you the best possible, um, you know, experience for the end users. But, you know, voice over LTE up until recently, like, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know about you guys, but, you know, AT&T really kind of grinds my gears a lot of times <laughs> when it comes to voice over LTE compatibility. And I think others would also feel the same way because they have stringent guidelines on what devices they want to even allow or support on their network. So if your phone is not a specific model and has an IMEI in this range or whatever, they're going to say, nope, we don't, we're not going to support voice over LTE. You're going to be stuck back in, in 3G land or uh, AT&T calls it HSPA plus. Um, that is just fancy 3G. That's not um, actually 4G. So, is there is there a particular reason why AT&T is so stringent? Like, are they doing a different? Like, do they have like some type of customized codec that's a little bit different from what T-Mobile's doing? Or yeah, that's a good question, Dennis. I mean, in, in my testing, you know, I've done extensive like packet captures from phones, like like from iPhones and from Android phones. You can. 
you could pull the actual network traffic across the wire in our case across the air you can pull that off into a file and you can extrapolate that and look at the actual data that passes through it i can't tell uh at t doing anything different from verizon the only people that i've ever seen or the only company that i've ever seen do anything different is sprint um, Sprint used to do some really weird stuff with their voice traffic, uh, where they would route it across VPNs. Um, and I don't know, I don't, well, obviously they're not doing that anymore because Sprint is gone and, and T-Mobile has acquired them, but, um, Sprint's network, their voice network was really intriguing because I found it to be really stable back in the day, even when at and Verizon were not quite there to the voice over LTE standard. Um, Sprint, uh, as you probably know. Um, was acquired a, a while back by T-Mobile. But in my world and what I'm used to seeing, I'm not used to knowing Sprint for their cellular capabilities. Sprint actually has an immense uh, backbone across the United States, like in terms of fiber. So they are responsible for a ton of fiber that runs from the east to the west coast. And, you know, in addition to all the spectrum that T-Mobile got when they purchased Sprint, they also picked up all those circuits in that nationwide fiber network. And I think that is kind of like one of the things that that we're all kind of forgetting here is that T-Mobile was really struggling with their backhaul and picking up Sprint uh, not only helped them with their 2.5 gigahertz uh, in 41 spectrum, uh, well, at the time it was um, uh, the LTE for, uh, band 41, but They've also tapped into the the expansive fiber network across the, the country. So I, I think that's we're going to see a lot more we're going to see a lot more growth uh, in what the capabilities are because the highways have been opened up, and I think it's just going to be such an, a great experience moving forward for all of these customers. Um, and now that we've got the the stir and shaken method implemented, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen that or have heard about what that is. Are you talking so about with uh, scam call? The stir and shake for FCC guidelines for rooting out scam calls. Exactly. Yeah. So um, one of the the cool things about that is you know is that you can actually validate what's called the caller ante. Um, that caller ante is the number that's presented to the far end. So if I call you, Dennis, um, before the stir and shaken method, I could just make up some fake number and send to you. Like I could pretend to be Stetson and send you a call, and I could send you Stetson's number. And then when you miss the call and you call it back, you could actually call Stetson. So the stir and shaken method has provided an additional layer of security for uh, not only landline calls, but also voice calls. And, and it's really cool. That is really cool. It sounds like it's helping to validate the number that you see calling you is the person that is in fact calling you. And when you pick up, you can answer with a little bit more confidence. Um, yeah, and that's what you'll see on there. So that's an, I don't know how they do it on Android since I currently don't have an Android phone, but you'll see the the check mark next to the number okay. in your call history if you look at that. Um, I don't know if Mint uh, has imp implemented that or if other MBNOs yeah, is, are doing that. Is that a network thing? Is that a carrier thing? Like were the carriers working together to develop this or, or do you know the backstory of what was going on there? That's an I'm not a, Yeah, oh, I'm not sorry. sure. Uh, go, go ahead, Dennis. Uh, so that's an FCC mandate based off the increase in scam calls, and that that technology is implemented at the carrier level. Or let me rephrase that: that's being implemented by the three major networks, so T-Mobile, AT and T, and and uh, Verizon. Mm -hmm. um, for MVNOs, I would imagine there's probably just type, some type of SOC or or provisioning of firmware that is just necessary to take advantage of it because it's actually happening at the core level. Have you seen any in your testing? I know you, you have an iPhone, uh, Dennis. Have you seen that on yours at all? Um, so I actually don't. My iPhone's behind me, uh, mm -hmm. my 12 Pro Max. I actually don't use it that often. I actually use my Galaxy S20 the most. Okay. And uh, I, I do know you're talking about the green checkbox. It's usually verified by Scheme Shield. Yeah. Um, Google Pixels actually have their own software with like the you can call like if I call my dad's Google Pixel 3A. I have it set up so that like he it gets like a little transcribed like the person has to actually talk so you answer the call so that's oh, even yeah an, I, I think that's app. called Google Duplex where it'll like answer for you a call screening yeah which which I actually think is an even more effective way of doing things than the stir and shaken method um, because ultimately all automated systems are going to have flaws there's nothing better than 
you the person being able to read and see this like an actual person talking and not Jessica talking about your car warranty. Um, <laughs> not but... Jessica again. How many car warranty how many car warranty calls do you guys get every every week? Oh, man. Um my so my main T Mobile number has been like pretty tamed down over the years. Mm-hmm. Um but one of my new numbers that I got for the uh free line probably gets about fifty scam calls a week like Sheesh. no i was gonna say like a day oh wow oh That's my nuts. god yeah i don't uh i definitely don't get that many i use i use the t-mobile scam shield on, on my personal line and it seems to block like 90 probably 95 percent. i get maybe one <clears throat> maybe two every couple of days but definitely a lot less than than when uh when i didn't have it yeah I don't i've think... been uh i've been getting hit really hard with a student services asking about my outstanding federal student loan balance oh yeah it's yeah, been going like to my Google voice number and that's just forwarding to my phone. And I don't think like I need to just turn that off because it's getting really repetitive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why that's I turned true. off the digits, one of the digit numbers. But um, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't really think it's I don't actually think scam should works that well, to be perfectly honest. Um, mm. I just don't. Um, Interesting. I mean, even mm-hmm. once you notify a number that it's like a bad number. And it'll just get a voicemail. Another number is just gonna come up in its place. Like yeah. it's gonna like take it. Um, I feel like. Sorry. Oh, I was, I was just gonna say. I think that's that's gonna change, Dennis. Um, you, you know, right now the stern shaking method implementation is still. I feel like in its infancy. You know, all the carriers have come out to their newsroom and said, "Oh, look, we've we've implemented this feature and it's already out there." But I think in order for that to be effective across the board other carriers are going to have to implement that because, you know, you're not getting spam calls from T-Mobile or Verizon or AT&T. Dennis, you're getting spam calls from these shady uh, PSTN carriers that uh, have interconnects with exchanges and that are able to dial into, you know, like the actual PSTN. Uh, And what I mean by PSTN is the publicly switched telephony network. And that's just the network in the United States um, that follows the North America number plan. So what? that's just a fancy way of saying any 10-digit number, right? In the United States, we dial 10-digit numbers. Um, if you want to dial outside of the United States, you have to enter in the country code and then whatever the digit length is for that country. Um, probably, you know, for a lot of people, you know, they don't know that the United States' country code is plus one, but you've probably seen that on some documentation, whether it be at the bank or whether you go to the mall or, you know, you go to the restaurant, you'll see that plus one, 10 digits. That's just a, a moniker to denote that that's a United States phone number. Yeah, no, I, I was going to say, I feel like for Stern and Shaking to work, if I understand it correctly, basically everybody has to do it and you have to have mm-hmm. a huge database that basically says, and that's inherently a flawed way to do things. Because databases will always be incomplete or always be lacking in updated information. Yep. I feel like if we wanted to actually fix this problem and the most coherent way possible, it basically doing the Google Duplex way of doing things. Yeah, and I and I think that kind of folds into to what I was going to talk about next is you know there's a database that uh, they've already implemented a database called the ICANN database, which is how when Dennis you place a call to Stetson and Stetson doesn't have your phone number, it shows up as Dennis P. Um, yeah. you know, it, it will actually pull that information that you provide and your carrier provides to whoever routes the call and sends that information onward to Stetson. Um, and that's all, you know, it's not magic, right? You know, s- someone has to know who your name is, uh, and the carrier that you signed up with for your cell phone plan will know that information about you. I'm um, so I think you, do it. I was going to say, I'm curious for Stetson. Stetson, when I first text you, man, did it show up with my full name? I don't think it does. does no, it? no, it doesn't show up with anything. Like for, for a text message, I have to add you into my contacts. For mm-hmm. a call, I've pretty much only seen the number unless I've had the person in my contact. But it sounds like you can configure it that it'll display a number or a name. You can. And I, the only carriers that I've seen it work with are Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile, like straight okay. carriers, like mobile network operators. I've never seen MVNOs have a mechanism to do that because they themselves would have to take that information and update it with the carrier. So I don't know. I don't know how they would do that. But yeah. I know for me personally, like 
um, like my cell phone plan is it's signed up in my wife's name. So when we first got our plan years ago, I would call people and it would, it would show up as my wife's name and people would be like, <laughs> you're, you're not this person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I contacted T-Mobile and they, uh, they promptly changed it and now they have a way to do it online. So you can go online and change it to whatever you want. It just has to be a, a legitimate name and, and not anything crazy. Like you can't like, you can't put Batman or, or whatever. Hmm. It has to be a name on the account. Um, sure, that actually sure. is a, a real user. Well, I think T-Mobile, if I'm going to, like, T-Mobile lets you actually fill in what you want to show up as a caller ID. So I think that's whatever is going to display, right? So I could put Batman in there. Uh, yeah, it, but the thing is, it's like, it's not immediate, though, Dennis. I, I, I mean, I'm sure we could try it and see, but I know when you save that information, it goes, well, you know, it could take up to 72 hours to propagate. Because like we talked about earlier, it's a database. And that database just gets propagated out to other carriers mm -hmm. and says, hey, look. Every day, we're going to send you a Delta file, right? And whatever the difference is, uh, you just need to update your database with our database. And uh, sometimes when we do our testing for uh, calls, Seth and I was talking to you about this earlier, but when we do testings for cutovers or, you know, any network changes that we do either at work or, you know, that I do in my spare time when I'm tinkering around, we find that propagation not only across regions, but also across the US and with different carriers is very different. So like, for example, we could move some phone numbers from one building to another, and we could test that phone call to make sure it worked. It would work on AT&T, but it could take eight to 10 hours to work on T-Mobile. So, wow. you know, these networks are not magic and it's not instantaneous across the board. Each carrier has their own exchange where they route phone numbers from one regional site to the other. Um, and I think it's just important that people understand that, you know, when we think of T-Mobile, we think of this behemoth, or when we think of AT&T and Verizon, we think of these just massive data centers ingesting all these different calls and data, and they do, but there's still a local presence within each region that governs a lot of those things that we, that we know uh, and use every day. That's really, really cool to think about. Do mm -hmm. you know, uh, coming, jumping back a little bit to the voice uh, technology and what is being used there, are the carriers using the same tech or are they using different codecs and different implementations to transcode and transmit their, their voice data? Yeah. So, so back early on, um, when 5G NR was going through 3GPP to actually become a standard, uh, there was a, there, the standard wasn't actually called NR at the time. Uh, it was called TF and uh, that was technology forum. And that was proposed by, uh, and well, proposed and developed by Verizon and a number of other global partners. That standard eventually, um, you know, pushed the industry forward for 5G, but never actually made its way into the 3GPP standard. Um, 5G NR was then introduced, and then NR ended up becoming what we know now as 5G. Um, so, you know, these these names are really intriguing because. Uh, you know, back in you know 2012, when the first voice, or the first LTE network was introduced, they come, they came up with the name Long Term Evolution. Yeah, I remember um, and that. then now, you know, now we're talking about like new radio. It's all <laughs> it, the, the names. I just find comical because what do these things have to do with any of the technology that goes along with them? Well, um, you would think you would think that they would be more like. Uh, the what what the Wi-Fi Alliance has done, where they've rebranded um, 802.11 in uh, and AC and AX to be Wi-Fi 5 and 6, respectively. You know, those are easy for consumers to understand. Consumers do not understand. Uh, yes, I've got 5G new radio or, or <laughs> long-term evolution. That those that just sounds like nonsense. Right. Um, well, LTE yeah. was. Technically supposed to be the last like thing like if you like LT was a very long generation with lots of things that got added throughout mm -hmm. the way. Yeah, uh, there was even a point where we got LTA or advanced. Um, <laughs> all these different name changes are really just for the marketing teams, really, right? To convince people that this is new. Um, right. But a lot of the stuff that's in five G N R is just technologies that were from the LT era, with a you know a few a few exceptions, right? But. Yeah, when LTE Advance came out, you know, Verizon was was real heavy handed with the marketing on, you know, look at look at this new technology that we created. And it's like, no, no, that's that's MIMO, right? That, that is a technology that is a standard um, and everyone's going to start using that. And they did. Um, but I thought it was really inter interesting that they came out and, and wanted to be the first to, to have something on paper or, you know, so to speak, on paper, uh, like they were the first to market to do it. Um, do you but, but you know, what, 
What's that, <laughs> Dennis? I was gonna say, do you, remember, do you remember XLT? Oh yeah, the four that that was the four by four MIMO, uh, multi user MIMO, and that was like, I just don't get. Um, I mean, the marketing teams are genius, right? Because people see that, they think, oh my goodness, like Verizon has this XLTE network that's just blazing fast. And at the time it was, you know, we, I don't know if you guys uh, ever had Sprint uh, back in, what was this, 2011 or 2010 when WiMAX was introduced? Do you remember WiMAX? I remember WiMAX. Oh, okay, yeah. so so WiMAX was Sprint's failed attempt at coming into the next generation after 3G. Uh, we had Sprint 3G, and then there was uh, a fork in the road, right? You could either choose WiMAX as a technology to move on with for your next fourth generation of technology, or you could choose uh, LTE. Uh, AT&T and Verizon made the smart decision and chose LTE. Sprint did not. And honestly, I've often felt that that point in time really led Sprint to where they are today is not a company, because I felt like... They were so far behind uh, two to three years in LTE deployments that they never even caught up to at and Verizon, which subsequently led to their demise uh, You know, a year ago when they were purchased uh, by T-Mobile because they were just bleeding customers and their network was, was terrible at the time. Um, and I think those types of decisions are just really crucial uh, to the longevity of, of a carrier. I don't. I don't think that one decision is what actually broke the camel's back, though, to be hmm. honest. I mean... Okay. Um, like if you think about it for a moment, T-Mobile didn't even get LT on the, on the map at all until like 2013. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but they had HSPA plus though, Dennis and, and their HSPA plus network, which again was still 3g, but HSPA plus has a maximum like 42 rate megabits. of four, like 42 megabits. HSPA mm -hmm. plus was 42 megabits. And at the time, you know, 2013, that was still really good. Even half of that 20 megs was really good. I mean, um, I mean, I'll just say like T-Mobile, but like even T-Mobile's HSPA coverage, their 4G, mm -hmm. um, was very limited. Most of, most of T-Mobile's native coverage back in 2013 was Edge. There wasn't even 3G; it was just 2G Edge. Yeah, and they had yeah. small, small, small. I can't emphasize how small the pockets of <laughs> HSPA Plus were. Um, yeah, I never, I never saw it personally. I mean, you know, like I always had Edge when I had T-Mobile. Mm -hmm. So for you, did it just jump from Edge to LTE? Mm -hmm. That must have been yep. huge. Yeah, it mm -hmm. was huge. I mean, I remember the first time I got uh, LTE with Sprint. It was it just, it was like, uh, I mean, it was like waking up in the morning feeling refreshed as opposed to just going to bed really late and feeling groggy and tired. That's That was <laughs> literally the feeling that I felt um, when Sprint got LTE. But yeah, I, you know, to, to your, I agree, Dennis. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't say think it was like the straw that broke the camel's back, but I think it was a very big, uh, it was a very big issue at the time, and I think it really kind of led them down the path of, you know, making bad decisions and doing things that were just not great. On a sure. on a side note, Stetson, I just want to say LT was not the breath of fresh air for me because T-Mobile didn't improve the back all for another two years. Oh, so, so you get, you got the little status bar in your phone, but the performance was still trash. It was literally one megabit per second over LT. Okay, yep, that's that's pretty trash. That was well, non-peak hours, by the way. <laughs> Sheesh. Um, you know, when we talk about, like, voice quality, you know, kind of getting back to that, you know, voice quality is um, measured in kilobits per second. So if I call you, Stetson, right now, you know, a typical call uh, over the wideband codec uh, currently with voice over LT is going to be about 64 kilobits per second. Okay. And it doesn't and, sound like a lot, but when you're thinking about just traveling voice, like sending voice traffic across the wire, across the air, that's a lot of bandwidth for one voice call. And that's what you would expect to see. Like, that's what we see on landline phone calls. But you're getting whoa. landline voice quality across the air. And I, I mean, I feel like that's really good for voice over LTE. That sounds um, incredible. And, and with the ultra wideband codec, that's basically the maximum throughput you could get with voice over mm -hmm. LTE for audio, right? That's right. Yep. Um, uh, and I'm, you know, I want to make sure I'm, I'm clear on this. So the IVAS codec will support that, but the older codec that, um, that T-Mobile introduced back in 2016 was only up to 20 kilohertz of, of actual bandwidth. Like, so across the, the actual audio spectrum, you have different kilohertz that measures, you know, low tones and high tones and things like that. 
uh, and that allows you to have varying degrees of voice quality. So when you call in, like 20 years ago, you made a phone call that was like eight kilohertz. That was nothing. It's just, that's why it sounded like you were talking in a tin can. <laughs> you were um, a robot. You were a robot. It was just kind of like this, like, you know, kind you of didn't, like this. You didn't need to disguise your voice. It was disguised it, for yeah, you. Yeah, you didn't have to because the system would do it for you. Um, but now when you call people, uh, especially, you know, carrier to carrier um, that support, you know, those codecs, the super wideband codecs, and you guys have probably already seen it. Uh, I think T-Mobile markets it as HD calling. And I think Verizon does too. Is that what it's called? Um, yeah. Where you can call carrier to carrier, but when you pick up the phone, it sounds like the person is right in your ear. And that's because they're using all of that audio spectrum, all 20 kilohertz of the audio spectrum to listen to your voice and then transmit it across the air. So it, it sounds like quality is kind of a combination of getting the kilohertz of spectrum that you need to transmit the tonal range of the voice in that's addition right. to the bandwidth to supply mm -hmm. the actual data. That's right, Stetson. Yeah, you, you can't trans you can't transmit you know twenty kilohertz of a bandwidth with uh, you know eight kilobits per second. Okay, so you they know, just go like, hand in hand. It's like driving a tractor trailer through you know through like a, a mouse hole you know in a wall. It's <laughs> yeah. just not going to happen. Austin, real quick question for you, man. Yeah. Um, Wi-Fi calling uh, mm -hmm. with the carriers has been something that has been very interesting recently. Um, I agree, especially because T-Mobile actually is going to be retiring their Wi-Fi calling 1.0. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering how Wi-Fi calling uh, is different from voice over LT or, or voice over NR, or is it mm -hmm. literally just the same? Yeah, it's, it's not the same. Um, you know, one of the, the biggest differences um, we look at when we think about Wi-Fi calling, right, is when you turn on your phone, you have to manually enable Wi-Fi calling. Like it's a, it's a service and it runs atop the data network. Uh, in voice over LTE land, you have to go into your phone settings, enable Wi-Fi calling, provide an emergency 911 address, um, agree to the terms, and then, you know, I, I don't know, Android phones are different than iPhones or whatever, but the way it works is it creates a connection directly from your phone outbound to the internet, and it goes to a server either at T-Mobile, at t or Verizon, or wherever you're enabling Wi-Fi calling for, and that's how the calls route through. So if I'm at my house and I enable Wi-Fi calling, there's a connection on my phone right now that registers over, uh, I think it's either TCP, I think it's TCP. Uh, there's two different, two different methods, TCP and UDP, but I think it's TCP, where it registers the device to that server and says, okay, this device is Wi-Fi calling capable. We have an active connection to it. Let's go. And that's how it knows to route the call inbound to you if you receive a call. Because otherwise, like if you have a phone that doesn't have any service and you don't have Wi-Fi calling enabled, the carrier is not going to know where to route that call to. But if you have Wi-Fi calling turned on and you have it registered to their IMS server, you're able they're able to see in real time like, OK, we know that Dennis has a Wi-Fi connection currently. This is his IP address that it's being sourced from. We're going to send the call to that. And that's how they guarantee calls make it to you. So wow. they're, they're very different, Dennis, in, in how they're, they route call. They, they're still a voice over IP technology since they're still routing calls over a network. But in the Wi-Fi calling realm, it's all done over the internet, whereas opposed the voice over LTE is done over the cellular network. It sounds like there's a server basically acting as an intermediary then between your phone, like it's acting as your phone, receiving the mm -hmm. call, and then, okay, boom, we have a connection, this person's on Wi-Fi, we're completing the call with that, uh, whereas if yep. you're on LTE, it's just, just using the data as it normally would. Right, and, and you, you've you probably seen, uh, again, I'm not 100% sure how Android shows it, I think Samsung does it different than Google, but on iPhones, um, if you look in the top bar, you'll see carrier name, why, you know, why Wi-Fi, why right. hyphen yeah. Fi. And that signifies that your phone is connected to that server and, and registered essentially to enable you for Wi-Fi calling. Um, and that's why, you know, we've seen a lot of, uh, we've seen a lot of stuff on, on Reddit where some customers uh, that are using the T-Mobile home internet service have had issues with Wi-Fi calling. And I don't know, um, I've heard some people say that it was fixed with a firmware upgrade. Uh, some people reboot their phones. You, you know, there's really no telling why that doesn't work. But 
it's really dependent on the connection from your device over your Wi-Fi network at your home or your office or wherever you're at. Um, and eventually it's going to find its way to T-Mobile's network to where That's it has a, a presence. Actually, a great point. We have a question in the live chat for someone joining the YouTube live stream. And the question is, how does your phone know if your service strength is low enough to enable mm -hmm. Wi-Fi calling? It sounds like where is that threshold, that cutoff point where you're like, all right, I don't have enough service. We're going to Wi-Fi mm -hmm. calling. Or is it like anytime you're connected to Wi-Fi, you're just getting routed on Wi-Fi calling? Um, it's not all the time. I, I know, I don't know for other carriers, but for me, like with T-Mobile, I typically see with an RSRP of a hundred or a hundred or higher, yeah, like negative 100 or higher, and I'm connected to Wi-Fi and I have Wi-Fi calling turned on, it will opt for Wi-Fi calling over the uh, voice over LTE network just because it's a better like signal. Yeah. I don't know sure. how it would be for AT&T or Verizon, but uh, def like, there's definitely a threshold for each carrier uh, where, that is an acceptable threshold as far as like, you know, RSRP, RSRQ, SINAR, all those numbers play into how they calculate where to route the call. And, and those just indicate signal strength to your tower, right? So your RSR and like, that's just how strong your cellular signal is. Yeah, it's, it's strength of signal, but it's also, you know, noise. So, so SINAR is measuring the, the level of radio interference that's going on between your phone and the, and the tower. So if like you have great, like you've probably seen this before and, and you too, Dennis, right? You've seen your phones show five bars of signal and then you run a speed test and you get like 0.5 down and then 0.5 up. Uh, that's not always a sign of congestion. You could just really have a lot of interference and that could be causing that. That is awesome. so cool. On a side note, I was just going to say, I'm pretty sure that the it's not even the carrier that's determining it's your phone. Your phone's just looking at the signal levels and being like, okay, at this at this point, which my carrier determined mm -hmm. based on the firmware, I will use Wi-Fi calling and vice versa. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, I don't know. I mean, they're not making a decision in real time. Like, you know, hey, like we have, we're tracking Dennis's phone and we're looking at all the numbers all the time. I'm sure there's something in the software of the device no, that it, determines it, that. I'm saying it is the client device is what I'm saying. That would be the most, like, that would be the most logical way to do it, right? Because yeah. it would be stupid to like if, if you had weak <laughs> Try to signal probe real time. <laughs> yeah, like it'd be stupid. Like if, if the person doesn't have good signal, then how the heck are you gonna know? <laughs> like when you're yeah, trying you to send out your right? little... you, you wouldn't know because if they don't have good signal, then you can't get accurate information. So, so yeah, yeah, it I, would just it would yeah. just be the client device. Um, yeah. But um, circling back real quick though, do you know? So we were talking about the super wideband audio codec that's used over for voice over LTE, but do you know what the codec is that's used for Wi-Fi calling? Um, you know, I don't. I, I would assume that they're also using the uh, the IVAS codec, uh, which is the super wideband codec, uh, because I'm sure, like, I haven't done testing to see what that would look like, but I know when I do a Wi-Fi call and when I do a voice over LTE, uh, voice over LTE call, they're very similar in call quality. So I would imagine they're probably similar, Dennis. And do you know? Do you know why? Uh, I mean, did you hear about T-Mobile retiring their 1.0 variation of Wi-Fi calling? Do you know what the differences were between that and like? No, I haven't heard. I haven't heard that. Where? Um, where was that announced? Um. Well, honestly, I heard about it from Sneed. Sneed oh, okay. Tech. Gotcha. Um, yeah, you know, I, I have not heard it. about that. I mean, I'm sure he's got he's got the inside scoop with all the the T-Mobile folks. So I, I'm sure what he says is is the gospel. Um, cause I think he has some friends that work there. Yeah, no, but like basically they're going to be retiring Wi-Fi calling 1.0, which okay. it, it only affects like older phones, but I was hoping okay. that you might be able to know what was different yeah, about that. And... I didn't know it was specific to like, so I didn't know what the 1.0 mention was there, Dennis, but I did see recently, um, I've been following the T-Mobile community and also the Reddit forums for the T-Mobile subreddit, but they have been emailing customers, letting them know that their phones will no longer be compatible. Um, and I, I, I've saw, um, not specifically to T-Mobile, but other carriers are sending out free phones to people. Um, so it seems like, you know, it seems like if you if you play the long game with these carriers, eventually you'll get a, a phone. Um, but yeah, I saw I saw that they were going to be doing that, and uh, I guess they, they call it Wi-Fi calling 1.0. Uh, where they're going to require you to have a more modern device that probably supports, you know, wideband audio and and much better codecs and has better hardware to actually send and receive those calls. Sure, sure. All right, I have a slightly different question, and mm -hmm. it's, you know, 
when you make a call over voice over LTE or voice over Wi-Fi, I feel like it sounds pretty good. You know, as you mentioned, you have enough yeah. capacity to transmit voice. But when I make a FaceTime audio call, it just sounds night and day, crystal clear. Yep. The person's voice is in my ear. I'm getting all the intonations. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, what is going on with FaceTime audio that is just making it uh, so much more realistic and providing all of that vocal clarity that I feel like you may be missing with some of the other voice technologies. Would well, you know, maybe it's the codec or yeah, how is that working? Yeah, as, as far as I know, Stetson, you know, originally when FaceTime came out, um, they were using the H.264 codec. Um, okay. And that that is a that was an industry standard codec back in 2012, you know, or, you know, kind of in that realm. And then we've moved on to H.265, which is now called the HEVC codec. Uh, which allows for higher, um, higher quality, uh, with... higher, higher quality, yeah. you know, audio and video through higher bit rates. So the new HEVC codec, as I understand it, will allow up for a thousand uh, hertz. So you can Whoa. get the, I mean, the spectrum is is you know all the way from like I think it's like zero to a thousand uh, hertz. So you can really get all of the the tonal you know differences between you know breathing and your voice and you know shouting and you know excitement and all the things that you would hear in person with your ears you can hear that all now through the wire um, but so, i agree with you though i i when i call people and i know they have iphones i'll just facetime audio boom. With them. yeah it, yeah 100%. it's a much better experience than trying to to do a normal you know voice over lte call even though that's really good uh, and even wi-fi calling is really good too but i agree uh if they have facetime audio that is that is absolutely the best way to do it you know what's the best audio though what is that? Good old school analog. Oh, tennis, get out of here. You know, <laughs> I, uh, I I do work with some folks that, uh, and I won't say their names, but they I do work with some folks who who are older that would would absolutely agree with you. You know, the whole the whole old analog phone, eight bit or eight hertz, um, you know, stuff like that. They just love the way that sounds. How it sounds kind of like velvety and raspy. Whereas the new uh, wider super wideband audio sounds very like uh, digitized and robotic and just doesn't sound natural because you're not used to hearing that. But I imagine in 20 years, people are going to think, okay, well, this super wideband audio sounds so good. And then there's going to be a new wideband audio, you know, even the super, super wideband audio. I don't know. Um, I, and I, I don't know what that would look like, but uh, you know, my guess is it's just a personal preference. I honestly prefer my voice though when it is compressed sometimes like for mm. example with this mic I can actually go in and change you know what audio picks up like right now I have it on natural to sound normal but okay. some you know how like um specifically like really old mics from like say like the 50s and stuff you know that like radio host sound like what the really old mics <laughs> yeah like yeah, like um uh, what's it called the uh um uh, like Shawshank Redemption you know have you seen that movie where they have uh the yeah, yeah I have them but okay. but yeah. there's a specific sound that comes from the, like those old mics that I'm talking mm -hmm. about, and the same thing could be said from like the original old school like analog phones. Like your voice just sounds sometimes different. Like mine, for example, when it's compressed like that, makes it sound much deeper, much more like manly. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like hello, hello. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Everyone's yeah. talking with a super deep voice because we got yeah, we're all new like, microphones. We're all eating, eating steaks and drinking wine and you know reading by the fire. You know, Stetson, Dennis, your like, your your deep voice sound made you sound more like a smoker than trying to lower your voice. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Okay, that okay. Funny. My next question is: you know, we talked about voice over LTE. It mm. sounds like that's widely available. Voice over NR. How can our audience, our viewers, our listeners? go out and experience voice over NR? Do you need a certain phone? Do you need a certain network? Where is this new evolution of call quality? So as of probably a month ago, the last time I saw it, um, you know, the only device that I have seen that is currently using voice over NR is the T-Mobile OnePlus 8. No uh, way. And, and the OnePlus 9. They, they have... Um, in the t in the one plus like on the phone itself if you go into the band selector it's kind of like you can turn on or, or turn off 5g if you turn 5g only to on and you disable all the 4g lte bands and you place a call um about six months ago that would not work but up until you know like i said about a month ago was the last time i saw it work you can actually place a call 
um, and route your calls over uh, voice over NR. And the way to tell, number one, does the call work? Because if it doesn't, and the cell site that you're calling from does not support support voice over NR, um, which would mean a standalone voice network, because you can't route uh, voice over NR over non-standalone 5G, uh, oh, from wow. what I've that's, seen. That's actually perfect. We had someone in the chat who was wondering about that. Um, yeah. Would voice over NR work well over non-standalone 5G or yeah. only standalone? That's right. Yeah, I've not seen a way, and, and, and I, I think that's by design, right, is that, you know, in order to route voice over NR traffic um, to its destination, you've got to have a 5G core. And when we talk about, you know, enabling 4G and 5G at the same time, when you place a call, it's going to be preferred to route over LTE rather than NR. And I don't, I haven't found a way to change that. Um, but it, going back to what I was saying earlier, that's in T-Mobile seems to be the only company, you know, only carrier in the U.S. that I've seen that has voice over NR support. Um, at and Verizon have, you know, come out and said, hey, you know, we're you know, obviously we're planning it, you know, it's in the works, whatever. But uh, in the real world, used by real people, that's the only carrier that I've seen uh, it work on. Um, um, as far as the phones, though, I, I'm pretty sure, Austin, that the S20 supports it. Um, like yeah, just... the chip might support it, uh, Dennis. I, I'm just saying, like, from what I've seen uh, out there in the wild, I mean, if someone out there has a device, uh, try turning all 4G LTE off and do 5G only and make a call. And you can make sure, you know, you can look to see if you're on 5G standalone by just pressing there's a there's a key command on the samsung's where you can look at all the bands right guys yeah 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 just like it's like iphone field test mode where you can look to see are you connected to nsa or, or standalone um but yeah if it supports it dennis i would imagine it would all it would work uh but i've only ever seen it work on the on the one plus do you want to test nine. it do you want to test it right now stetson real quick that would be uh, cool uh, yeah, if you want to, I mean, give me yeah, a call. Yeah, I just, me... I just put on band. Do, do you have your one plus, your one plus nine, Stetson? This is this uh, an uh, S twenty plus. Dennis S20 is trying it right now. Uh, so Stetson, I'm on, I'm on uh, NR seventy one only. Okay. Um, I got. I'm the getting call a call. Going. I'm answering the call. How do I and, sound? Um, do I hold it up to the microphone? That's gonna yeah. cause so much echo. <laughs> yeah, I can hear it, but I sound good, right? I mean, you sound yeah, you sound good, like a normal call. I would say. I think the podcast sounds way better, but that's just me. Yeah, well, I would, I would, I would hope so, right? I mean, you know, it's it's kind of a tough, uh, a tough demo. You know, Dennis yeah, put you on the spot. You know, it, I would it say it, full, full it, demo. it went through. Yeah, it worked. So yeah, it, and and what I've found, at least in my testing around where I live, um, that will be hit or miss, or at least it was six months ago, because some sites don't have 600 megahertz. Like they say, they've deployed it to like 200 million people, but where I live, some cell sites simply don't have that. Um, so like if you don't have 5G standalone and you turn your phone to 5G only and you try to make a voiceover in our call, it will not work. It will attempt to dial and it will just fail. So and it sounds how, like that's how you know. if you're on 5G only and you've disabled mm -hmm. all other bands and you place that's a call right. and it goes through, then it will be voiceover NR because that is the only way to make a call at that point. That is the only way to make a call. That is, is so cool. Voiceover NR. Yep. Austin, I am so curious now. I want to go out and test this. I want to grab my Samsung phones and my iPhone. <laughs> I can't do it on iPhone because you can't disable the bands, but I want to grab my That's Samsung right. phones, drive yeah. around Colorado, and see if mm -hmm. I can get some of that voice over NR experience. That sounds so, yeah. so cool. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. I, we recently just got, um, you know, at my house, we, we got the tower closest to it. It's about, I'd say, like a mile and a half, uh, but we've got 600, 600 megahertz here. And uh, voice over NR works great. You know, it works just as good as voice over LTE. It's, it's weird to see the next evolution since we went through the first evolution of really the first real evolution of voice from 3G to LTE. Because honestly, we didn't talk about 2G to 3G, but we didn't need to. You know, yeah. I, I sat in line in 2007, I believe, and bought the first iPhone. Wow. And that was when that was when um, they had the the edge network. That was that was it. You know, you could get like 56k dial up speeds across edge, and uh, even making a phone call, it did not sound great. The brow the web browsing was terrible. You know, all of the anything data intensive never worked. Um, so to go from using a codec that has a higher bit rate than what the fastest data speed was 14 years ago. It's really cool, and, and I liked. Really I'm cool. excited to see where the next ten years takes us. 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I know there are actually some devices now that allow like for a podcast scenario, you can call in and have a phone plugged into a recorder and mm -hmm. answer a call normally and it'll record. And yeah, it's going to sound a little bit like someone's talking on the phone, but the audio quality is so good. Like that's uh, actually quite passable for kind of a podcast listening experience. And yeah. it's been really cool seeing that, that evolution. So I think maybe to conclude this segment, unless there's other things you want to mention, but my, well, my question would be, what is your preferred way to make a phone call? Oh, well, I make a lot of phone calls, Setson. Um, I have phones everywhere all over my house. I've got phones over here. I've got a desk phone. I've got two cell phones. Um, you know, the pri like primarily when I join meetings for work, uh, I use Zoom and WebEx uh, and Skype. Uh, I personally prefer to use the actual audio, like computer audio on my device, whatever I'm calling it on, rather than use like dialing a 10 digit number. You know, right. you've seen meetings where you can dial the number, put the meeting code in, you put the password in. It's like four steps to just call into this meeting. And since I've joined so many of them, I like to just hit the button and it uses just voice over IP audio um, and uses the, the G711 codec, uh, you know, super wide band to go into the meeting. Um, for me though, if I'm calling, like if I'm calling my wife or if I'm calling my sister or family member or whatever, uh, I'll just pick up the call or pick up the phone and, and dial FaceTime audio. It's just, yeah, they all have iPhones and it's just such a great experience. So Absolutely. If, Absolutely. If you can do it, great. Um, if you're like Dennis and you just love the Android life, uh, I think, you know, voice over LT is an absolutely great option that you can use for that. Um, the other thing Stetson that I, I think, don't think we've touched on, and there's really not a whole lot of information about this out there, but I want to just bring this up. So we've all used FaceTime before over LTE, right? And we've all used Google duo and all of the, the video chat apps, uh, Skype, whatever with the introduction of 5g, uh, there is a new technology called video over NR and Whoa. it's going to, it's going to allow carriers to actually deliver video headless and without apps. So right now what, what they have is you download an app, you sign in with an account, then you leverage the LTE network to actually route that traffic from wherever you are to wherever it needs to go. Um, with video over NR, the carrier was going to be able to enable video directly at the core. So you don't have to do anything. You don't have to download any apps. You don't have to like sign in or anything. It's just going to be part of the phone. Like the native dialer is on your phone. You just press the phone button and you dial 10 digits and it calls a number. Video over NR is going to allow you to have a, a way to do that without involving the app store, the Google play store or whatever. T um, so I'm excited to see what that looks like, you know, over the next couple of years. T-Mobile already has that feature, actually, um, with LTE. I, I saw they ran the test, Dennis, but I didn't. I mean, I haven't seen like I saw that they recently ran the first commercial test over video over NR. But I, I is there a use case that you found? No, I mean, I mean, they've had that since LTE. I mean, it's voice like they have video over LTE. Like that's already a thing. Like if you, it's it does. There's no um, what's the word I'm looking for? It doesn't work cross carrier. You have to mm -hmm. be like a T-Mobile, T-Mobile call, but like mm -hmm. it's literally built into the dollar. So like Austin, if you had T-Mobile and you had an Android phone that supported it, meaning you could have a video call over LTE. And, mm, interesting. Yeah. And, yeah. And I, but I mean, you said it's only carrier. It's like carrier limited, right? It's only for T-Mobile customers. I mean, that sounds right. like a pretty, pretty solid system. I, I would imagine that 5G would open that up to others. I mean, but I mean, it's not really, I mean, it's not really that different from when, Voice over LTE was a thing, right? Like when Voice over LTE was first uh, mm -hmm. executed upon, there wasn't cross, um, like you weren't able to do like an HD call and stuff like that between AT and T and T Mobile customers when HD. That's right, yeah. So I mean, this is no different, right? Like, there's hmm. certain things that just get a little wonky because the carriers, you know. Yeah, they're all doing their... different stuff. And... It boggles my mind. I actually remember I was I would do text message tests, and if I was texting across different networks the 160 character limit would come into play and the message would be split up into multiple chunks. But I found if I was texting network to network, oftentimes it would come in as just one cohesive message, like in order, not split up. Uh, so yeah, I wish, I wish they worked better. Hearing this news, Austin, I'm first super excited, but also very concerned because if you followed what's happened with RCS, it basically hasn't oh, happened. What a disaster. <laughs> and, yeah, and what I a feel disaster like, that is. I feel like so many people text 
or message more than they call at this point, at least, you know, some of the younger generation. Um, and that uh, I'm going to be honest, just doesn't leave me optimistic with how this video over NR implementation will pan out the compatibility and things like yeah. that. Yeah, they, they, they relate to the game, right? And I think we're, the ship has probably sailed, you know, for a lot of people that use phones today, they, they have their favorite apps they use and all the things they log into with their accounts and stuff. But I mean, uh, you know, RCS, man, I, I just, we can't even get into that. That is such a disaster that they, they have, they have butchered that so bad. Um, not coming to an agreement on, you know, a replacement for SMS. I mean, SMS is, is so antiquated in the way that it works and, you know, the character limits and the compression of, you know, sending pictures. Cause you know, SMS was never designed to send pictures, you know, when it first came out. Right. Um, and then they were like, well, what if we just shove this picture in this little tiny like datagram and send it on? And, uh, now we now because you've sent like sms pictures from an iphone oh, to an yeah. android phone before it's it's terrible it looks like a potato i it mean SM, a potato. i mean sms quite literally was one of the most profitable things for the carriers back when they charged for it because <laughs> it literally used so little data like um and it's so low cost to operate it's hilarious um yeah. as far as rcs is concerned i think that rcs is already behind the curveball anyway um like it's great, it's better than SMS in a lot of ways, but it sucks that it's not encrypted. Like that that yeah. that sucks from a security standpoint. Um, and as far as like file sizes, I think it still only caps out at like ten megabytes. I think, uh, if memory serves me. I would. Yeah. Oh, is that I RCS? Saw, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I saw recently, Dennis, to your point about encryption, I I saw there was an article um, back before Christmas of twenty twenty that. Google was working to roll out into an encryption in the Android Messages app for RCS. Um, yeah, but that's what, not. But, but again, yeah, but again, that would require everyone to have that app, and not yeah. not every. Yeah, and that's the problem, right? That is, that, that is the inherent problem: is not everyone yeah. has that app. Yeah, yeah, like I'm saying, like at this point, RCS should just be scrapped. They should just they should just do a new standard. Encryption should be baked in. <laughs> Just no, seriously. seriously. Like, okay, blow blow the doors off. We're done. Start over. Just, Back just, to the just at this point, just start over. Like it was a dumpster fire. We're gonna put it out. <laughs> We're gonna roll the dumpster over there and forget no, about I it. I mean, no, I, I mean, you think I'm joking, but I'm being really quite serious. Like every carrier has done in a different implementation of of advanced messaging. Like AT and T calls it advanced messaging, and they have their thing where if you're talking to AT and T customers, it works. T Mobile has their thing, but there's no crosstalk anyway. So since we're still not on the same page. Right. Yeah. And the standard we're trying to deploy anyway is already inherently flawed. Instead of trying to force rule out this inherently flawed standard, we should go back to the drawing board, execute upon something that's actually future proof, i.e. focus on the security vulnerabilities that are within this new messaging system that need to be addressed because, you know, we kind of use our phones for two factor authentication. So encryption <laughs> would probably be important. <laughs> um, yeah. And then just deploy that <laughs> like. Yeah, and I, I find I, my guess is that'll never happen because I think one of the things that people I, I see people, but you know, like local governments, law enforcement, you know, other entities love about SMS is that they can subpoena carriers for that record of information. But like when you go call Apple for that stuff, they're like, "Sorry, get out of here." Yeah. Um, and I think encryption is a, a wide ranging topic that you know we probably don't have time for today. But you know, encrypted messages like messaging apps. Uh, it, introducing a whole different degree of, you know, vulnerabilities and like what's ethical and what, sh what people should do. Cause you know, right now today, if you send an SMS, the carrier can just go look at their server and say, okay, yep. Stetson said, uh, Dennis, uh, he was ordering you a pizza for dinner or, you know, you guys are going to the park together or whatever. But with iMessage, you'll never know. You, you don't, you can't see that information. And I and think that's, that's, how it should that's be. the problem. <laughs> well, that's but, the problem. Yeah. That's how it should be. But that's the problem because uh, people lobby for these technologies that are antiquated that allow, you to do these things yeah but then but then here's the thing though a lot of banks and my job and other things require two-factor authentication and a lot of them don't use an authenticator app or don't even have it baked in they use sms two-factor authentication and it is incredibly easy for me to get your six-digit pin that you get sent and use that against you to get in and break into your accounts. Like I don't even need an, I don't even have I don't even need to have access to your phone or SIM card. I can literally there's other ways for me to do it. Um I won't get into all of them right now, but 
if we're going to put in a new system, we should probably address that concern considering that it's going to impact everyone, including law enforcement, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree, Dennis. I mean, there's there's got to be a solution, right? With all these smart talking heads, you know, both in Washington and in the tech field, I'm sure that someone can come up with a new standard that works with all the, you know, all the carriers and everyone can be happy with. But, and like, plus, it's not like the government couldn't have like a, like they couldn't have, they could have their own like private way to break the encryption, right? As long as they have the, you know. Uh, yeah, and I think that's the point of contention, right? Is that, you know, they went to Apple, you know, years ago when there were, you know, shootings and things like that that had gone on and um, Apple was like, we're not going to give you that. Like, yeah, they we, Apple we, had we to can't even, take yeah, a stand. They, yeah, they went to yeah they went to court and they were just like we we can't do that. Yeah, and, uh, but I'm yeah, just that's... saying I'm just saying like let's have encryption even if the government has a back door let's have something there then nothing at all is my point. But let us move on from this topic because I definitely took us somewhere that we probably shouldn't go. <laughs> uh, let's answer some Patreon questions, Stetson. Yeah. Uh, so first one actually came from the beginning of the recording and it's what are the 3gpp release i think the question is values it says valves and i just valves doesn't make sense to me so uh release values or is there a place if that's like a lot a long list that we can direct people to to check out the 3gpp and to learn more about you know their yeah, they, evolutions they have yep. their own website where they talk about it all the time in fact i can probably pull it up for you in the chat and link it in the comments awesome then as you do that we will move on uh next question let's go to mark what is one foreign country you have not been to and plan on visiting soon <laughs> gentlemen and planning on doing any travels i know i feel like a lot of travel plans have been uh, scrapped the past years but maybe things yeah, open no, up that, that's an interesting question mark thanks for the thanks for the question i um country i have not been to um I've not been to Germany and I have not been to Japan. Uh, those are kind of like on my bucket list. I want to go to Japan. That's like one of the next countries I want to visit. Uh, Tokyo, you know, go to Tokyo and kind of, you know, go downtown and see what's going on there. Um, I've been to a lot of countries all over the world. And, you know, I'd say, you know, honestly, one of the coolest places to go visit if you get the chance is to go to Scotland. It's a really beautiful place to go. A lot of really nice people, a lot of good food. Um, if you like that kind of stuff, but sweet, yeah, I'd sweet. say, I'd say Japan, um, you know, Japan for sure. And, and Germany would be, would be the two coolest countries to go. Let's go together, Austin. When we're in Japan, we could try out some of the nice whiskey. They're actually really <laughs> well known for their whiskey. The, yeah. Like some Habiki and you know, what, all the different style, you know, whatever you want, like the Nika coffee grain and you know, yeah, just we'll, name a couple, just to we'll name a couple. Some, we'll get some of their fancy melons too, that are like exclusive to Japan. I'm, you... I'm down with all of it, Dennis. I, I, I love Japanese culture. Um, honestly, like, you know, it's so like, so cool to see. And there's so many documentaries that I've watched over the past couple of years on, you know, not only Japanese culture, but cuisine and things like that. Um, oh, I'm, I'm it's well, just exciting. I'm well researched, man. I watch tons of anime. So I obviously know everything there you about go. Japanese culture. <laughs> yes. I work, um, I actually work with a guy. He's, uh, he's like, he's a quarter Japanese. Um, he, he doesn't, he doesn't necessarily look Japanese, but, uh, somewhere up in his bloodline, he's, he's Japanese and he, he talks about, you know, one, one day wanting to go back and everything like that. So I think, I think it'd be a cool trip. If we could put that together. Maybe you can go too, Mark, you know, if you want, if you're interested. And Stetson, <laughs> but, we had to bring Stetson along. Yeah, so yeah I, definitely I should jump. probably get outside the house. It's probably yeah. good for yeah, me. Yeah, pro probably. Yeah, open those curtains up a bit, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would say I haven't been to Australia yet, and I feel like that would be a cool place to check out. Stetson, I feel like fun. if you went to Australia, either one of three things would happen. Either a you kangaroo would, would, an accent. Either yeah, I, I would get an Australian accent. I was going to say either a kangaroo would kick you really hard. Some scary spider would come into your hotel and like bite you in your sleep. Or, um, or you'll just have an awesome time. I'll have an because. awesome time. I'll sign up for Boost Mobile. Boost Mobile Australia. Give it a try. Yeah, and get call Peter and uh, yeah. <laughs> see what's going on. Because Australia is a scary place, man. That's where all the scary animals are. It's yeah. like the top 10 snakes in the world live there, all of them. And the most, <laughs> and the most deadliest spiders. Like, okay. they're like a comedy. Maybe um, Thailand or something then. Oh, I was there Thailand. for a week, Stetson. All right. All right. All right. We got to move on. So from your international travels, this question comes from KO. What are uh, at least two things other countries are doing in wireless communications that you, A, believe could happen in the U.S. in the next five years, and B, want to see happen in the U.S.? Mm. 
Well, I will say, you know, I was um, back in 2018, I went to London. Uh, I was there for a week. And, you know, I guess one of the biggest challenges with living in the United States and, you know, being a carrier in the United States is just how much landmass there is compared to other countries. We were already seeing, even in 2018, full on like mass deployments of 5G radios, 5G towers, things like that, just getting ready for, you know, for the deployment. And then one day they just turned it all on and now the whole country's lit up with full 5G. And, you know, I know T-Mobile recently did that too with their nationwide 5G network and they covered, you know, 200 million some odd people. But, you know, people always make the claim like, oh, the United States is, you know, not number one in cellular technology and deployments. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, no kidding. I mean, look at the size of Japan and look at the size of England and Scotland. Um, and you and you compare that to the size of the U.S., um, the speed in which they deploy technology is great. And, and, you know, to that question, I'd like to see us deploy like technology much quicker than we do. There's so much red tape to cut through. Uh, we've got a, a project I'm working on right now where it's been like four months since uh, we ordered fiber. And it's, you know, permitting for cities and cutting up roads and doing things that I would imagine in other countries uh, or in other regions that are not as, you know, as well developed would not require that. And I think that is because we have so much landmass and there's so much logistics that go into either running fiber or building a new cell tower. It just it just takes too long. You know, you you know, it shouldn't take eight months or 10 months to build a tower in a cornfield. Yeah. Yeah, we just want it, you know? It's yeah, going to benefit so it, many right? people immediately. We just yeah. want it. It, should, it just shouldn't take that long, though. Um, but as far as, you know, the to the first part of that question, you know, what do I want to see? I, I mean, I want to see us move quicker in deployment of technologies, uh, technology standards and, and get things done, like cut through the red tape of permitting and, you know, wait periods and all the things that are associated with, with deploying either fiber or new cell towers. What's the second thing? Uh, second thing I would say, um, oh, so compatibility, Dennis, you know, one of the things that I, I noticed when I was in Ireland, uh, moving countries just a little bit, uh, was you, when you go into a cell phone store, you know, you can just buy a SIM card or you can buy a phone and all the phones that they have and sell, they all work together. Like there's no special provisioning or anything like that that you have to do. Like some carriers don't support certain cell phones, right? They or you know, you have to have a specific model of a variant, like with Verizon, you know, they, they do their own custom one plus phones. Um, they used to do their own Motorola droids that were different from T-Mobile and AT&T. And even when iPhones came out, there were Sprint specific iPhones or AT&T specific iPhones or Verizon ones. Um, other countries have really come together on doing a standard and they say, okay, these are the LTE bands we're going to use governed by, you know, this governing body, we're going to deploy all the same stuff. And then you can just roll on our network. And then the differentiator is in um, level of service you get with the carrier, you know, what kind of plans, how much you're paying, um, what perks you get, but they're all using the same infrastructure, right? You know, uh, EE is sharing it with Vodafone and, uh, you know, Vodafone is sharing it with Orange. Everyone works together much more collaboratively rather than in the U.S. where T-Mobile is just like, nah, you're, you're not going to roam on our network or uh, Verizon doesn't roam on AT&T. Uh, it just doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I agree with that sentiment. Um, I lived in Korea for a month and there's literally two, two carriers and they share all the same coverage. They literally share the same back fiber, everything. And it's mm -hmm. a way better experience uh, from like an end consumer standpoint. And it's way more efficient use of the spectrum. Um, yeah. I will just yeah. say that that problem is resolving itself with time. I mean, as CDMA gets shut down, you know, all LT is GSM based and all uh, NR is going to be the same like standard. Um, and most phones that come to the US at this point do support pretty much everything with the exception of maybe millimeter wave. Um, for the different carriers. So that problem is resolving itself slowly. Now, as far as yeah. sharing of the networks is concerned, that's not going to resolve itself for <laughs> yeah, obvious well, reasons. But yeah, yeah, I wish I wish that there was a, um, you know, I know how like the way Apple does their iPhones uh, in the US, they give you a you know dual SIM, right? So one, one slot is eSIM and, and one slot is physical SIM. 
I've heard that in like countries like China, they, they just offer the same phone, but they give a tray with two SIM slots, two physical yes. SIMs. Yeah. I, I would like to see manufacturers come to an agreement with one another for countries and radios to support all the same bands. Cause I find it really frustrating that like you can buy a phone, like let's, let's say you don't want to spend a thousand dollars on an iPhone. You want to spend $500. Well, maybe you buy that $500 phone and then one day you decide you want to travel to Germany. Well, Germany might not support the 5G bands that your phone has. And there, there's just a disconnect between the manufacturers of these devices uh, and what they support and what these countries are deploying. I, I just I don't understand why we're not more like centralized as a whole in what we support from a hardware perspective. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And one of the things for me is, like, I know Apple released, uh, I think it was the iPhone 10 in China, actually had a dual physical SIM card. And yeah. in the United States, it was just one physical SIM with the eSIM. I would have loved to have seen uh, dual physical in the U.S. as well. And then, as you mentioned, just like, cro like global compatibility with the networks for all these devices. Like, they should be global. You shouldn't need all these different models. That's I think that would yeah. make for a, a way better consumer experience. Yeah, definitely. And, and uh, well, on that topic, Justin, and we can move on after this, but I, I just wanted to say um, OnePlus drives me up the wall <laughs> when it comes to the nonsense. And, and even Samsung up until recently, where they will have their U.S. model of their phone. Um, like if you buy a OnePlus from T-Mobile, you get the phone that has like one SIM slot. But if you buy the same phone, in like China or you know like Thailand or wherever or India, they have two SIM slots. I, I don't get why you wouldn't just make one phone and have the yeah. same features. You, right? Why would you? Why would you do that? I, because, I honestly don't have the answer. I mean, maybe economics somehow. Because, I mean, the reason is because two reasons. One is that in those markets, dual SIM is important because, like you mentioned, India, for example. It, it's very regionalized in what networks cover where. Like here in the US, we have a lot of like overlap, right? Like Pittsburgh's gonna have coverage from T Mobile, ATT, and, and uh, Verizon, right? India, you're gonna have cities where it's just like literally actually just one option, like, mm -hmm. like legitimately. Um, and then as far as why make two different phones, it goes back to different band support, right? It is cheaper to have a whole second model of a phone that you don't have to pay royalties on to Qualcomm, who has like a monopoly on all these different band supports that the US uses, and just make a global phone that supports bands like one, two, whatever the common denominator of bands is. You can reduce your expenses on your phone sales, which improves profit margins, which at the end of the day, it all comes down to money. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that don't, totally makes sense, Dennis. I, I, I get it. I, I just, I find it annoying that. I, as a consumer, would have to, you know, find another phone that yeah, would support yeah. the network when I go to that visit that country. It's just, it's, it's annoying. Just, yeah, yeah. No, I right. mean, I mean, most phones have support for common bands. Like, if you, I mean, if you go to India, you're gonna be fine. Like, your iPhone. I mean, iPhones are a great example. They they literally they're support, one of the best. Yeah, like, mm -hmm. and like same thing with like Samsung's Samsung phones. Same thing with. Mm -hmm. uh, Google Pixel phones, like most main brand phones that are here in the US are going to have support for pretty much all networks, right? Because yeah. all networks, generally speaking, are GSM based. And we're the only we're one of the only few countries that has CDMA, CDMA based networks aside from like China and like, and like Korea. And guess what, our phones have support for CDMA. So US phones are literally the best phones for travel. It's mm. not that it's, it's bad the opposite way around people that come to the US, I feel bad for you. I'm sorry. Um, well, but... I'm in their court. Okay, Dennis. Okay, I'm supporting them. Like, I, I yeah. feel bad, too. Yeah, yeah. I feel bad, too. But okay. uh, we have another question um, for you, um, and it's from K.O. Did you already ask him this question? The uh, no, question? K.O. asked two questions. Okay, sorry. Um, so K.O. asked the second question. He asked, what are at least two changes that need to be made in order to catapult the U.S. from a 4G communication experience to a 5G communication experience? And what does that translate into for the average consumer? Mm, that's a that's a great question. You know, I think uh, well, obviously we'll just get this first one out of the way. You know, the first issue is that people don't have five G phones. So in order to get people off the four G network to the five G network, they've got to have a device that's compatible. And I think with the normal cycles that people go through between you know three to five years of, of 
upgrading their phones. I mean, I don't imagine that everyone in this country or even around the world is like us where we get a new phone every year or, you know, sets in every six months, you know, every you're not buying months. the latest device yeah. and selling it on Swappa. Um, so, so yeah, I think, you know, three to five years is probably going to be the time, you know, that we see that transition, you know, at and Verizon up until recently didn't even have a 5G network. Um, and our, arguably I would say they still don't really, they've <laughs> they got don't. millimeter they wave. Fake paired. One. Yeah. They've got millimeter wave. Uh, which is great and, and awesome. The speeds are insane. I, I actually saw a millimeter wave for the first time today uh, where I live in, in in downtown, and it was insane, like no 1,500 way. megabits per Were you per T-Mobile? Second. Is this a T-Mobile uh, This was on this... AT&T. This was on wow. AT&T. Yeah, so I, I went to lunch with a friend of mine, and, and he had an AT&T phone, and we were sitting there eating lunch, and he was like, what is this 5G plus indicator on my phone? And I, I, you know, I was like, oh, this is, you know, you must get millimeter wave, and he speed test, and it was just, absolutely blazing so so i think you know the first answer to that question is you know we've got to get handsets into the hands of people um and that's going to happen you know in three to five years uh, we've also got to lower the cost of handsets i mean the you know the five the cost of a 5g phone compared to the cost of a 4g lte phone today is substantial you know mm -hmm. even the cheapest 5g phone now I, I see you shaking your head dennis um you know we recently t-mobile had is giving away phones with some of their phones like if you bring in an old crappy bag phone or whatever you can actually get a free 5g phone and you know i think that's really the first phone that i've seen that was within a reasonable price point for a lot of people because not everyone spends a thousand dollars on a cell phone and i think you're gonna have to get a lot more like options for people in that you know two to four hundred dollar range because, you know, the iPhone SE was what people wanted two years ago. You know, the, the, the second iteration of the iPhone SE, which was just a, I guess, a rebranded iPhone 8. Um, yeah. That was such a weird design. But, <laughs> you know, that was kind of like the 399 price was kind of what people were willing to pay out of pocket without financing it. Um, so I think if we can get more devices like that. Uh, that's We're going to see a lot more. But I, I can we'll, think of literally 10 phones off the top of my head that are in that price point with mm -hmm. Motorola's one 5G Ace being like yep. 300 bucks mm -hmm. and free right now from a lot of carriers. Yep. Uh, Galaxy 42 is coming out around the corner. That's at that four. Not out so yet, though, right? So, so that's I mean, not, it's that's coming not, out. That's not on the list. It's literally coming out tomorrow. Well, I, I, my point, Dennis, I, I agree with you. And I say that there probably are more than one you know, or two that I've mentioned. I'm just saying like those phones did not come out until like the last eight to 10 months. And that's probably in the time frame which people are still fine with their 4G LTE network phones. I mean, I know people that are on AT&T currently and you included Dennis that have no issue with capacity or features or anything like that. AT&T's network is insane. Their LTE network has so much capacity that even moving to 5G really is not gonna be a substantial move for them um, because they're going to supplement that with millimeter wave. So I get your point, Dennis, and I, I agree with you that there are probably a bunch of phones out now. I just think we need to see more phones um, and we need to get more in that price range. And, and people need to know about them. People don't know about the Motorola Ace or the, you know, the Galaxy Stetson Dennis phone or what, what you know, yeah. these, yeah, yeah. these obscure brands and these obscure series of phones that they sell like at Walmart and Target people don't go buy those. They buy them online and they buy them in stores. They're not selling these phones like on the showcase. And, and maybe they are. I just, I know when I talk to my friends, they know, you know, Samsung phones, Google phones, iPhones. Yeah. And currently there's not an iPhone that is within even, uh, you know, like shouting distance that costs, you know, what is the iPhone 12 mini cost? $650? That's the I think cheapest. 700. Is it 700? Yeah. Yeah. So, the only 5G phone they they sell is $700, and Apple has you know like a, a pretty substantial market share in you know the cell phone space. And I know it's like Samsung and and uh, and Google and all those big players too. They have a, a much bigger share, but I just think we need to see more. I think yeah, we need no, to see more devices. I think that's a great point. I mean, we're seeing more and more now, but people mm -hmm. aren't ready to upgrade. And I think what's challenging is even as new budget 5G phones come out like last year's flagship LTE phones are approaching really good prices. Like you can get an S10 for a really good price at this point. 
Um, and some people may be interested in that. And as you mentioned, like this is the first generation of 5G iPhones. So people who are really into the iPhone ecosystem and Apple's ecosystem, they're not really gonna have a budget option until Apple releases one, which I think is a little unlikely at the moment, or you know, it's three to four years down the road and this year's iPhone 12 is suddenly selling for like $400 or maybe $300 on a gently used site or there's a trade-in deal or something. Mm -hmm. I don't, I just disagree. Like, I just don't think cost of the phone necessarily matters because your average consumer isn't buying their phone outright. Like they're paying five or 10 or whatever the payment is on their phone plan. So if the phone's a thousand bucks, that's not what's like stopping them. I think that the, the bigger issue here is, is that 5G isn't doing anything meaningful for consumers to make them want to upgrade for that reason. Like if they have a Galaxy S9 Plus, which is a fantastic phone that I had prior to my S20, mm -hmm. right? I'm not upgrading it because of 5G. 5G isn't doing jack diddly yeah. right now. Um, there's no apps that do anything that LT can't handle. It's not, it's not like back in the day when like LT came around and we started seeing things like Google Maps take off and we started seeing like, you know, Uber Eats and all these other services that needed LT to work, like come out of the woodwork, right? Like 5G is not doing anything special at the moment. And I would agree with that too, Dennis, but only in your case, because you have AT&T. Like I said earlier, AT&T's LTE network is so robust. And for you, totally, like you probably are not getting anything. If anything, moving from LTE to 5G on AT&T's nationwide 5G that's using dynamic spectrum sharing is probably worse um, because you're sharing that bandwidth, you know, with, with the LTE, LTE network. Yeah. So I agree, Dennis, in, with that, you know, with that sentiment. I just, um, you know, availability is definitely a big thing. But, you know, also for you, um, you're on AT&T, but like for me, I'm on T-Mobile. So for me making the jump from T-Mobile's 4G LTE network to their 5G network was substantial. Like they just didn't have a lot of spectrum in my market uh, in uh, in LTE. So when I moved to 5G and I saw like the two, like N41 uh, midband, it was it was night and day. But I've seen AT&T get uh, you know midband speeds on their LTE network using, you know, carrier ag. I mean, I have like it's crazy what AT&T is able to do as far as speeds go, um, just from a capacity standpoint. Absolutely, all right, so we gotta round this question off. Two things, we need more affordable 5G phones and we need people to get them and buy them. That's one thing to leapfrog 5G. Second thing, I would honestly just say C-band. Like we need that mid-band spectrum to really mm -hmm. offer that like improved performance in way more locations. Do you guys think, uh, yeah, I know, I saw an, an article recently where Verizon was saying that they, they've already started deployment of, you know, new antennas and towers and things like that to support, you know, uh, C-band. Where do you think that ends up, uh, Dennis? This is a question for you. Where do you think timeline-wise that ends up uh, getting fully rolled out? Like, when do you think Verizon comes and says, hey, look, we've got C-band ready to rock. You guys can start using it now. Two years. Two years? Two years. I think two years is all Verizon's going to need based off how much money they're spending. Because they're spending $10 billion alone just for the C-band deployment. So I say you two... Go ahead, I, sorry. I was going to say, so I think two years is the amount of time that it will take for it to be available in enough places that they're covering, like, let's just say, 90-ish percent of Americans. Mm-hmm. And then the remaining like next two years after that will just be filling in the remaining like gaps, similar to how N forty one is being deployed right now with T Mobile. Which, on a side note, Austin, I do have T Mobile as well. They're actually the one I use more. Um, but oh, that's but, right. Yeah, you're on the uh, the Magenta Max from your uh, your One Plus, right? Yep, I have AT and T. Yeah. I have T Mobile, and then yeah. I also have US Mobile using Verizon. Um, so. But, but yeah, I Very think cool. two years, two years is what it's going to take for C-band to be deployed in a meaningful way that's like usable. And that's just based off the amount of money that Verizon is allocating to it. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you know, they, they talked about that C-band spectrum getting available to be used the first part of 2022. I, I think they're going to take the T-Mobile approach where the first month of the first day of 2022 comes around. They're going to say, all right, we're lighting up C-band in two markets <laughs> yeah and then they're gonna make a press release about it and then over over the next year dennis like you said you know they'll slowly quietly start adding you know 
C-band everywhere and cover, you know, 90% of Americans. But I definitely think that they're going to really jump the gun. Uh, once, oh, no, uh, 2022 I, I think Verizon's going to get the panels and stuff like that and already start having them installed. And they're going to flip a switch similar to when mm-hmm. they deployed their low band um, 5G. And it's going to be like, boom, it's in 40 markets <laughs> or whatever it is. And yeah. then... And then it's going to, and the reason why I'm saying it's going to take two years though, is because they're going to probably run into some problems where there's going to be certain areas where, you know, X TV provider or whoever needs to reallocate their spectrum over to a different channel for it to actually be live. And that's going to be the thing that makes it slow. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm curious to see it myself. I'm hoping, I'm hoping it's sooner than that. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited for that. My first taste of C-band. Sneed says there's already 30 markets getting C-band antennas right now. No so. kidding. Wow. Yeah, That's I think awesome. I'm optimistic we'll see a bigger rollout initially in early 2022. Um, but yeah, to Dennis's point, I do think it'll take longer to, to fully build it out and flesh it out across the United States. Um, we had another Patreon question kind of around C-Band. What latency and upload can we expect from C-Band? Hmm. It's tough to say. You know, I, you know, I would imagine C-Band would be very similar to what N41 is today. You know, I don't know. I, if I agree with seen, that. I, I think you're going to probably see anywhere from like the, you know, like the 10 milliseconds to, to 20 milliseconds, it's, which is what I'm seeing in my market. I mean, certain areas have 40 megahertz. Some have 80 megahertz, just depending on which tower is lit up that day. But I've seen as low as seven milliseconds uh, on wow. the latency side. Um, and I've seen as high as about 30, 35. Um, but that could have been a fluke. You know, I, yeah. I don't really... And upload, are we getting a dedicated channel for C-Band? Like I know Millimeter Wave, for example, it's crushing it on the download, but the upload speed is still basically over LTE is my understanding, or like it's... Uplink? (sighs) Uplink Yeah, I mean, I've seen 100 meg on on N41 upload, or uh, Stetson, I mean, that's pretty pretty slamming. It's not obviously what you would get for, um, you know, downlink, but I feel like it's adequate for most people. 100 meg uploads. Uplink is typically handled by your low band frequency. So okay. whatever, that's usually your anchor. So for T-Mobile, that would be, um, you know, their N71, 600 megahertz, you know, that would be. So what do you, what do you think we'd see for a C band, Dennis? Well, I'm saying like, I'm saying that it's not going to be used for uplink. Like Verizon's. Oh, not it just straight use... up. It just won't be used at all. Like they'll yeah. just use it for the download. Yeah. I'm saying like, it'll probably be like C bands used for the downloads being in Verizon. We'll rely on their 700 megahertz or whatever for their uplink or, or band five for Verizon. Thank you, Sneed. Um, so yeah, like it's not going to be used at, um, it's not going to be used at all for the uplink is what I'm saying. Sweet, sweet. And my guess is that that number will go up, you know, every month people move off of 4g to 5g. So, you know, the capacity as, as we free up capacity for those low band, like that low band spectrum, you know, you'll get more and more, uh, as time goes on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, two more questions to round this podcast off. Evan coming in, uh, which carrier do you think is your favorite overall as of right now? And this could be a MNO or an MVNO, I think. Hmm. You know, I, um, I mean, obviously I've, I've talked a lot about T-Mobile. I, I personally use T-Mobile. Uh, I've got so many free lines from them. So, I mean, it's unreal. It's unreal, Austin. That's what it is. The situation is, yeah, I have so many free lines and, you know, my bill is so cheap for what I pay. I'm, I'm on Magenta Max and it's, I don't know, I think it's like 150 bucks for eight lines or something or nine lines. Um, anyway, so I'd say T-Mobile is definitely high on my list. Um, but I also love US Mobile. You know, one of the things that really intrigues me um is like their super lte network which needs to be changed uh, if you i'm at if you hear this um we need a new name for super lte network um the i love the transparency and the visibility into the apps that they provide to their customers like in real time where they're able to pull data um in your your discussion with ahmed uh Stetson was was awesome because he kind of laid out what it you know how they pull the data from verizon and get all the information and you know i don't think they actually advertise that it's on verizon's network but yeah you know the super lte network is Verizon. but being able to get all that data and just having a really nice clean interface and having um you know like they have new shared uh pool data plans now uh they're just doing a lot of really innovative things in the wireless space so i, I would say definitely t-mobile uh just because they're just killing it uh and then also us mobile uh, those are kind of like my, my two favorite uh right now 
Yeah, I, I 100% agree with you. I think US Mobile is probably my favorite right now. I mean, it's a it's a close. I love Mint for their full feature support and their affordability. And actually, Dennis is wearing the Mint Mobile <laughs> yeah. t-shirt right now, right on cue. But I think, yeah, what I, I love US Mobile. Their app is so beautiful. Like, I really feel like they're different in the MVNO space where the experience is just so smooth and seamless and you're getting unprecedented amounts of data as a customer and their plans of keep uh, coming down in price with, you know, as they're able to offer these new deals and negotiate these things. So I think with what they're building in their tech stack and what they're able to offer to consumers, I just love following that. Uh, so they're my favorite right now. ATT prepaid to Stetson just to, just as like a, you know, third okay. possible option. I think their pricing is so competitive and they have so much capacity that even on AT&T prepaid, you're still getting really good data priority and All a right. good experience. My my favorite M and uh, my favorite carrier uh, from an M and O standpoint is probably T-Mobile, just because they offer a well-rounded experience as far as customer service is concerned, minus the hiccup that happened that one time. Um, my favorite M V and O though uh, is probably going to be U.S. Mobile as well. They were the literally the easiest, most painless person to give my money to when <laughs> signing up for. Like they literally made it easy, right? Um, and it was easy to activate the SIM card. Uh, their customer service has been like pretty solid um, when answering questions. And yeah, it's been good. Um, but if we're talking about which carrier is the best as far as performance, because um, I know that's probably something to take into consideration, I would say AT&T hands down has the best performance at the moment. Sure, sure. All right. And final question, what carrier do you use for your personal line? Well, we already kind of answered it. We all know this. I personally use Mint. Love Mint. They meet my needs, and they're super affordable. Dennis, what are you on? T-Mobile and a uh, T-Mobile Magenta Max and AT and T Unlimited Elite, and then Austin, your Magenta Max, as you said, right? Well, that's one through eight. So I have eight Magenta Max lines. Uh, five of them are free. I also have a Red Pocket GSM. Uh, well, it's the Red Pocket AT and T plan. I'm on the. Yeah. I think it's the thirty thirty dollar, uh, ten gig a month plan. I think I'm um, on that too. I should. Really, it's actually I a really, really it's really good because I use it for work, uh, because you get free international calling to like eighty countries, and we typically like in our in our line of work we do a lot of testing and stuff like that, and it's really cool to have a a way to, to call those numbers. So for thirty bucks a month, I get unlimited calls, ten gigs of AT and T. Um, it is capped at 75 megabits. Stetson, I think you highlighted that on your website too. With yeah, I pocket, did that. But, I'm um, curious to try that out. Go to an AT&T area in my market as well. Oh, it's definitely capped. It's a hard cap. I mean, it, the, the speed test just dies at 75. Um, but then uh, I also have a visible line that I've had for about two years. Um, and I've run with that. And then um, I think that's all I've got currently. I, I've, I probably... I probably will be looking at an AT&T postpaid line. I'm yeah, trying I'm to, to get one of that too. I'm trying to get circled in. Like, I Oh yeah. Did, I know you did a video on circled in sets in a while back and I check it every like once a week or so. Um, but no one is offering AT&T plans. Yeah. You've <laughs> yeah. got to get someone who really, uh, so if I can't find something soon, I'll probably just open up a, a postpaid line and I, maybe that's... try to start a little family. That's what I got to do. Austin. I'm with you. If anyone's listening to this, wants to join a AT&T family, I need to review them again, do an AT and T speed test. So drop me a line. Maybe we can sort something out. Get Los, I mean, get Los Mobile. I say I can't get Los Mobile because it's business elite. Like I need to review consumer plans that people are going to sign up for. Stetson's so it's like doing fixed wireless and like VPN, MPLS, like data circuits. <laughs> He's like, yeah, just get this. It's the best of the best. Five hundred dollars a month. <laughs> Defeats the whole purpose. Yeah, so like Los Mobile is great, and check out Carlos's channel to learn more about that. But yeah, for for my audience and what I need, I really need just like a the basic consumer plan that everyone else is going to sign up for. Um, yeah. So I think that's it for the show, Austin. I want to thank you for joining us. It was awesome having you on, learning so much more about Voice over LTE, Voice over NR. I feel like I've got uh, like a field day of testing ahead of me to to try that out and see if I even get that in Colorado. I want to thank everyone who joined into the show live, who's watching the YouTube. I want to thank everyone who's listening to the actual podcast format of this. 
And uh, yeah, consider supporting us on Patreon if you'd like. The link is in the show notes. Uh, vote on the next video that comes out. And um, Dennis, any any other concluding words? I know you're really good at these. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, nothing major. Just uh, looking forward to seeing you guys in the after show here. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and yeah, I know there are some questions we missed. So if you have them, join the after show and we'll try and address them there. Austin, thank you again. Please enjoy the rest of your evening. And yeah, Thanks for having me. Yeah, and I think that's going to be it. So take care, everyone. All right, take care. Peace. Bye.